Hey guys, uh, I'm Zohar. I'm from Kaltura. Uh, there's actually very little about Kaltura in this uh, talk. I wasn't really sure what we want to talk about, so I just talked about open source, but I'll just give a very brief, maybe high level of what we do. So Kaltura is a video platform as a service. Essentially, we, uh, we're sort of like a database for all your media assets and companies use us to do everything from uh, e-learning experiences to managing manufacturing floors and kind of surveillance cameras and all that stuff. So anywhere there is lots and lots of uh, video feeds and video data, um, Kaltra is a very, very handy platform to use and we're open source. Um, so maybe just a little bit about myself. Those are my ninjas. Uh, that's what I do in my spare time. I raise ninjas. Uh, I'm the VP of Platform at Kaltra. I've been there from uh, the very first day. Uh, and I'm very much uh, connected to this line over there. Um, very early on in my career, I actually found out that um, I love coding, uh, but not as really my day job. I love coding during uh, the nights when I actually can hack on things and, and do creative stuff. Uh, but where I really want to spend my day with is with people, is with uh, the community stuff. And uh, that actually worked out quite well. Uh, very early on in Kaltra, we decided to uh, become open source. Um, so our focus very quickly shifted towards developers, uh, developer relations, uh, being a platform, uh, and then founding sort of the organization side of Kaltra, um, which targets more the open source side of things, the community that uses Kaltra, that builds on top of Kaltra, that contributes back to the platform rather than just the commercial side. Uh, and then over the years, those two actually uh, merged and um, we actually found that it's a significant driver to our business in addition. Um, so that was a nice thing. Um, I don't know if that's very readable. <laughs> um, so a, a few interesting, unique challenges of Kaltra, um, whereas I, I found that um, there are two types of, of projects if we kind of sort of divide the world. Uh, when you think of open sourcing a project, there is um, there's a very specific uh, project that is a part of something or that is solving a very particular problem. It's self-contained, um, <clears throat> it's easy to understand where it fits, it's easy to understand how to install it, it's easy to understand how to distribute it. And then there is platforms. Platforms tend to be a joint mix of a lot of different stuff. And Kaltra is that kind of project. It's a platform, it's a bunch of technologies of all sorts of programming languages. Um, it, when you run it, you essentially run your own mini cloud with many different servers, with many different workers, um, with many different programming uh, languages and environments. And then, uh, you know, if you think of the analytics, there is a big data stack over there. And then if you think of the transcoding side, there is C++ and FFmpeg. And then when you think of the web serving side, there is both Apache and Nginx. Uh, and so there's like a big mishmash of very different technologies. And so the biggest challenge of Kaltura is how do we scale this thing up, but also make it very simple. Um, so the other thing uh, before we kind of get into um, the things that touch how you make your decisions when you go open source or when you open source a project, um, it's also about knowing your audience. And so one of the challenges that we've had over the years is how do we uh, install? How do users actually install Kaltura? Um, because of all this mishmash of technologies, it became actually very complicated. Um, so we had this huge, huge, huge manual that you had to install all sorts of different programming uh, environments and then install all sorts of different uh, uh, systems and then plugins and then you know, there were so many places you could fail during that process and people were so frustrated. Um, and so one of the things that we've uh, started doing very early on is actually trying to find a way to communicate with the users and understand, well, how do you use Kaltura? Where do you use it? What's the goal? 
all those kind of things. And uh, that actually made our lives a little bit harder, <laughs> uh, to be honest, because now we actually found that, well, people want to run it everywhere in every cloud, in every uh, infrastructure. They don't just want to run it on Linux. They also want to run it on Windows. Uh, there's all sorts of really complex stuff. And so one of the things that we needed to do was to kind of be more clear or clearer in how do we communicate about this. So what are the things that we do? What are the things that we don't do? And where you can contribute if you want uh, to become a part of this. So, how do we open source? How do you get started? Uh, what are the things you want to ask yourself? So I, I kind of put this sort of a, a continuum of decisions, but I think the really first thing you want to ask yourself is why open source at all? Why are you doing this? Um, and so there's kind of a, a very wide uh, range of decisions that you can make here and, and reasons. And so one side of it is because of ideology. I want to have my project open source because this is what I believe in, because I think the world should be open, because I think software needs to behave in different, uh, in certain way and so on. And then on the other entire end of the spectrum, there is because, well, it's just a business decision or, <clears throat> because because I want to disrupt the market or something like that, uh, but then there's many many different reasons in the middle. Um, so for one of the examples is an open kitchen, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this later as well. Um, but just because it makes your project better, uh, because it's a way to build software that is cleaner, that is more uh, um, honest in terms of how you build stuff, how you communicate what you're building and how you collaborate with others. Um, and then there is also what we ended up this, uh, going with in addition to uh, the open kitchen stuff is we wanted to disrupt the market. Um, so we were in a market where uh, video was just becoming a thing, uh, but there were already companies with a lot of investment and they were kind of dominating the very small market that it was back then. Um, so a really good way to disrupt that market was to basically go out with a very cheap default and open source basically being zero. Um, so our pitch to the market was this is better, but it's also not costing you anything. Um, so that way you can actually bring, break the market in terms of, you know, this is now the new default. Um, so whereas before you had to go and pay a lot of money to other different companies, uh, before you even get started with this world, now you have an alternative that is completely free. You can try it out. You can play with it. You can scale your system. If you really want to pay someone to do it for you, then you can go and, and you know, try out the vendors in the market. But before you begin, there is a, an alternative that is open source. And so that's kind of the first reason. So. You could say that our reason was sort of a user acquisition model, but it's really uh, disrupting in a market that was owned by someone uh, with a lot of funding. So uh, one of the things that I noticed in the description was that we need to talk about what are the tools that we use. <laughs> um, actually, in terms of like the supportive tools uh, that we use in order to become open source, uh, those are actually fairly light. We don't use as many. Um, so obviously GitHub, um, everything is on GitHub. We, because of the complexity of the platform, have a bajillion or so different repositories. Um, so you can get lost in, in our GitHub repositories uh, domain. So if you go into github.com slash culture, there's so many different things. But what we try to do is leverage GitHub's um, management capabilities to kind of highlight the ones that are more important or the ones that you need to get started with. Um, then we also have a, a website on caltra.org, which kind of guides you through how to get started. Uh, so you don't need to get lost. Uh, then obviously we use Travis CI for the CI stuff for automation and things. Um, unlike most people, we actually don't have a Slack channel. <laughs> Uh, to, to your question, we actually did find, uh, so first of all, we started before Slack was, existed. Uh, so back then we had IRC. Uh, the problem with those tools is that it's only real time. It's not just that it's not searchable, it is not searchable. Um, um, it, it, 
when people interact with you in a real-time environment, they expect a real-time response. And sometimes they get very edgy when they don't get it. Now, the reality is you don't really have people full-time just answering questions on the open source side. And so we found that a forum works better. Uh, it's it's also searchable. It's it's better for SEO. So Google, you know, finds it. So if you have a question about Caltrade, just go on Google and search, and it will come up. Um, but but really, it's those those questions don't tend to be real time centric. Like it, there's no real urgency when people ask those questions. Uh, but just because of the tool, they expect this kind of real time response and they get frustrated by it. So actually leveraging a forum we found works very well and this course provides a really good experience. Um, so if you're considering forums, we definitely recommend that. Um, Lucybot is a really fun uh, project that we also sponsor, by the way. Um, it basically uh, automates the creation of client libraries and uh, developer portals. So like all the guides that we have, the API docs and all that stuff, um, everything on developercaltra.com is basically generated from our backend using a schema. And then Lucybot basically reads off of that schema and generates a lot of different stuff. We actually have a talk by one of our developer evangelists, uh, Dunder in YouTube. Uh, if you're curious about you know, how we build with it, what we've done with it, and so on, it's actually a pretty nice uh, project. So uh, in terms of uh, installation, so we actually found that uh, for us, what works best, especially because of the complexity of the platform and different components, is actually to create RPM and dev packages. Um, so we started off with that, then we started scaling this up. We provided Chef and Puppet and uh, Anisable, um and then uh docker containers and all that stuff but really the basis of everything is the rpm and deb uh, packages which makes things a lot simpler in terms of uh tracking versions upgrades and all that stuff and again because of the complexity and all the Magellan uh dependencies and really rpms and debs have a lot of them so if you need apache as a dependency then well, it's already included in the RPM and dev packages. So you just rely on that. So that's uh, a nice thing. If you need to automate your uh, contribu contributor license agreement stuff, uh, we actually built a, this nice little project over there, Agent Contrib, which basically what it does is connect to your GitHub repository and then tracks whether the person who contributes now a pull request um, whether they already signed your CLA agreement or not. Um, and so if they didn't sign it yet, then the, the agent contribute will basically reply on the thread and say, hey, we've noticed that you have not yet signed the CLA. You know, this is the link. And then they click through, they sign it, and then it goes back and great. Uh, now you can merge this or review it or whatnot. Um, Again, if you're a small project and don't have a lot of contributors, that might be an overkill. But if you expect a lot of people to contribute, this becomes an issue. Um, so highly recommend uh, that you see it. Uh, that's pretty much it. So and then in terms of like product analytics and how we track what people do with consent and all that stuff, uh, we actually ended up building everything in-house as part of the platform. Um, Looking backwards, I wouldn't recommend it. I would build it <laughs> based on open source tools or kind of available serv SaaS services or whatnot. Um, but again, you know, some things you do uh, over the years and you learn from them. Uh, <laughs> so uh, talking about lessons learned, uh, a few things that we kind of learned on ourselves, I, I should maybe say, I, I debated whether to call this, this, these rules were written by blood. Um, so the, the number one thing is really, is it the self-contained system that you just, you know, very easily explain and set up, or is it a platform? And um, this is a very important question because it dictates a lot. It dictates, how you install the system, 
it dictates who are your target audiences. For example, in the very beginning, in the first version of Kaltura, we actually uh, tried to create installers for Microsoft. And we tried to do it in a way that was very, very simple for any business user to just go and install Kaltura. And that that was a very ambitious goal, but really because of all the complexity of the platform, you always end up with having to understand IT. You have to understand how to set up SSL certificates. You have to understand how to set up your cluster. You have to understand how, you know, the intricacies of, of how the network works, for example, in order to not take down the network if you have a lot of traffic, for example, suddenly. Um, and so it, then, you know, what we've learned from it was, hey, we really need to focus on the right user there and then provide the installer tools that will be right for them and not right for everyone. And so sometimes making it easier is not really a good goal. Um, and so this is a good kind of lesson learned. Um, the other thing, you know, we kind of talked about this in the beginning, but why, why even open source at all? Um, and I think kind of the uh, artifact of that is um, how much are you willing to invest in this? Uh, now, if, if you're a one-run project, that's one thing, but if you're a company and you're trying to open source a project, it can backfire if you're not investing in this, right? So if you're making the decision to open source a project and you're a company, do it responsibly and understand that it makes no sense to open source something and just throw it out there and not support back the community and not say, hey, we, you know, we actually care about this. And, you know, and, and that basically goes with a lot. It goes, uh, it means that your developers should assign some time to support the community requests. It means that someone should actually review issues and pull requests. And it means that you need to provide tools like forums and all that. Um, and, and over the years, we've seen a lot of different kind of open source libraries and tools come and go with different kind of experiences and also on ourselves where where do you invest more where do you invest um where do you invest your time where do you invest your um, money and so on the other thing by the way is is events right the is if this project is important to you and you've open sourced it how do you explain um to your, you know, if you're a company, how do you explain to your board? How do you explain to the people who invest money in this? Why are you doing this and what you're getting out of it? And so one of actually the great ways of, of doing this is to uh, start events around those, this project and actually invite people and show that there's a very lively community that cares about the project that, that actually works around it. Um, and it, it contributes to the overall branding and not just the you know, feeling good kind of experience. Um, the other thing that kind of relates to this is that community is not really open source and open source is not really community. Uh, they go together. Um, they're, they're not necessarily the same, right? You can open source something just to open source it and not invest in the community. You can invest in a community and not open source your project. And so figure out what your goals are before you do it and don't agitate people just because you've overlooked it. Um, this one is actually interesting. So uh, in, in the 13 and a half years that I've been doing this, I've, I've talked to a lot of different open source community managers. And one of the things that I've noticed in many places was um, that people were kind of demanded for matrix, like how many users are using this and um, you know, how many downloads do you have? This is my favorite, the downloads thing is like, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you can have millions of downloads and basically it's one bot. Um, and so really where it actually worked the best is where you start collecting stories. How do people use it? Why do people use it? Why do they care about this? Why did they contribute back? Um, once you start collecting these, you suddenly get a lot of meaning to this project. You, you suddenly actually understand what the value of it and how it actually plays into the overall strategy, especially if you're a company. Um, uh, so 
that one is is hard right every company manages their roadmap differently uh and especially if you're in a company uh, commercial companies don't like sharing roadmaps product managers hate that um they hate sharing their roadmap because of so many different reasons because of competition because they don't want to overcommit, because whatever right um but if you want people to interact with you if you want people to contribute back if you want people to actually care about this and plan ahead their work with your project then some kind of communication needs to be formed um whether it's about guidelines of like this is why we're building what we're building and how we're building it and this is our way and this is our belief and now those are the things that we're not going to do and if you want to do them then go ahead that's great um this is also good right but don't just leave it hanging because the worst thing that can happen from a contributor perspective is if i download a project i start building on it i love it i get excited about it then i spend like a month work contributing something building it you know to the best i can then i submit it as a pull request and someone replies back nope this is shit right and then developers will behave like that right build developers will respond that way but if there are rules that are you know decided ahead of time this will not happen this will not happen once because um when you as a as the person who started building this will interact with the project for the first time you'll actually see this is the manifesto these are the things that we're going to uh, merge those are the things that we're not going to merge and you should consider forking for um, and then two, because your developers will also be aware of those engagement rules. And, and it's also important. Um, so that kind of goes to the contrib guidelines. Uh, and then my last one is my favorite. Uh, I've been burned myself so many times with that being Israeli and impatient and answering anyone. Um, really, you do not have to satisfy everyone uh and you'll be open source and if if your project is successful you'll attract a lot of people and a lot of people have their own thoughts they, they have their own views on things and sometimes they'll be unhappy and sometimes they'll be unhappy for not really good reasons but that doesn't mean that you have to satisfy everyone um so again that goes back to actually by the way setting the right guidelines setting the right you know communication up, up front but at the same time you don't have to answer anyone everyone um you have to be polite and understand but understandings but really you don't have to satisfy everyone and i've actually tried <laughs> not fun um last thing is uh if you do not really end up this deciding that you need to be open source but you do like the way that things are doing being done in the open source world i highly recommend and again if you're an organization or a company um i highly recommend checking out the open uh organization book by red hat uh i don't know who was the guy from red hat over here okay yeah this is my favorite um uh, i i truly honestly believe that every company should behave like that um it's and actually our motto in Kaltura uh, has always been open flexible collaborative uh, which basically goes to kind of articulate internally to everyone in the company we expect that communication will be transparent we expect that um, as a platform people will be able to build whatever they want on top of it uh, and then we expect everyone to be collaborative and work together and not just, you know, keep it internally or to themselves. Um, like every, every organization should probably take whatever they think uh, from this, but I really love that book because it kind of articulates it very nicely uh, in an organized way. Um, so thank you. <laughs>